So tonight I'm going to be going through a presentation. It is about 40 minutes, so it's longer than the usual ones, but it's the first time we're doing this. And so I had a lot to cover and haven't yet figured out how to condense it all yet. Um, and then for our question and answer period, we are going to be joined by Lawrence LeDuc. And I'm going to read off uh, Lawrence's biography now so that everybody knows ahead of time. So Lawrence LeDuc is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. He received his PhD from the University of Michigan, taught political science at University of Windsor for a number of years. He's been a visiting professor at many universities around the world, a visiting research fellow at the Trinity College Dublin, Australian National University, University of Sydney. In 2015, Professor LeDuc received the Mildred A. Schwartz Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Politics Section of the American Political Science Association. And Larry's specialty is referendums, citizens assemblies, electoral reform. Um, so we're really glad to have him joining us tonight. All right, so I'm going to get started. So and just to remind you guys that this is the first in what I'm thinking in my mind as a two part series. So if you think of tonight as the bad news, the good news is coming. We're going to be having another webinar on citizens assemblies, um, which are a fabulous way to help engage citizens and make informed decisions. And probably we'll be having that sometime this winter. So this one's on referendums, and then we're gonna focus on citizens assemblies again in a month or two. So just before I dive into the referendum research, just to get started, uh, a little bit if, for those of you, unless you're really, if you're really new to the Fair Vote Canada's movement, you might like to look at, we look at OECD countries because these are for the most part, Western industrialized advanced democracies. And you might notice that almost all of our peers use proportional systems. And also it's very uncommon to adopt a proportional system by means of a referendum. So we have had a lot of experience with referendums here in Canada but that's mainly because the people that really don't want to see a fair voting system keep insisting on them. It's not because that's the norm. Um, around the world, uh, electoral reform is rarely adopted, uh, brought in by a referendum. It's either in a country's constitution or it's just a simple act of legislation. So I thought I'd just start out here with sort of the theme of tonight's webinar. And this was a quote from Yasmin Dawood. And you can see she was testifying to the Federal Electoral Reform Committee in 2016. And at that time, there were a lot of calls from the Conservatives for a referendum. I'll speak to that in a minute. And she basically just said a referendum is not necessarily a politically neutral choice. So if we had to have a theme for tonight, that would probably be it. So just to kind of go back to this, often it's seen like, uh, you know, referendum is the most democratic thing to do. You give it to the people, let the people decide what, what do the people want to do. Um, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple and the, the playing field is far from level as Professor LeDuc has noted. And during the federal electoral reform process, unfortunately, the Conservative Party chose not to engage almost at all in any constructive discussion around systems, values, choices, or anything like that. They spent almost their entire time uh, hammering on about a referendum. So tonight we may see why that is. And I'm starting with a quote from Professor LeDuc that says, while democratic values may dictate that the voters are almost always right, it appears increasingly to be the case that the institutions that are intended to provide solutions to difficult problems may just as readily act to block them. The playing field in many referendums is far from level. And so we're gonna talk, gonna dive into the research on that. So this is about electoral reform referendums, but it's not limited to electoral reform referendums. What I'm doing is pulling together research done by different people across the world and looking at how it applies to electoral reform and welcome to the people that have joined us i'm we're up to 238 people thank you very much for tuning into this so in addition to professor leduc's research i've gathered some research from dennis pilon many of you know him one of canada's top electoral reform experts alan renwick the deputy director of the constitution unit at the uk college london and Arthur Lupia, who is a professor from California, who testified on referendums to the ERRE. 
So this is almost the most important slide in this whole webinar. And uh, I hope this gives you the big picture. So this was research done by Professor LeDuc looking at referendums over about a decade, not elector reform referendums, although there is one in there, um, just referendums in general. And they look, and he looked at, uh, you know, a public opinion poll. How are you going to vote? Are you going to vote for change uh, a month ahead? And then how people actually voted on voting day. And you can see a very clear pattern here where the percentage of people voting yes, voting for change, dropped often 20 points or more between a month out and voting day. So what happened? That's what we're going to look at. And Alan Renwick then decided to replicate Dr. Leduc's research and see if that pattern was continuing. And yes, it was. It continued throughout the 2000s. So I think we can be fair, say fairly safely that this is what happens with rare exception, what happens in referendum campaigns. So we want to dig in a little deeper to that because sometimes people um, have experience with one referendum and then they get an idea that because this one particular thing went wrong in that one referendum, that that's what caused the problem. And actually there's a whole bunch of factors and we're going to look at them tonight. So this just is going along with what uh, Renwick and Leduc are saying. We had a uh, Frank Graves, who's the president of Ecos Research, Ecos Polling, uh, come talk to us at our last annual general meeting and somebody asked him about referendums. And what he said is, if you don't leave the gate with at least 70 or 80% support, you're unlikely to be successful because whatever the proposition you put forward comes under criticism or assault from all the other players and it inevitably loses steam. So again, he's saying, because the change side can, can and often does experience a 20 point or more drop on voting day, you have to be starting above 70% or your chances are not that great. And Arthur Lupia, the referendum expert from California who testified to the Electoral Reform Committee, um, explained this to the Electoral Reform Committee. He said, I have a statistic to tell you just how skewed this is. In California, where there's a professional referendum industry, most will not touch a yes campaign unless it's polling 70% or more in a, a year advance of election day. So you need that. It's not just a majority, not just a strong majority. You need practically a unanimous consensus in the population um, to have a good chance of succeeding at a referendum. So then we come to electoral reform. So we've all seen the polls and the polls have been very consistent. There has been polling on proportional representation by, I don't know, at least 10 different polling companies over the last 20 years. And they consistently show that Canadians support the principle of proportional representation. They want votes to match seats. They want the popular vote to be reflected in the House. They want the byproducts of that, which is more compromise and cooperation and stability. Um, so, but is it over 70%? Mm, not always. It's usually hovers somewhere between 59 and 75, and it just depends on the, the moment of the day. Do you know what I mean? So we're not consistently over that 70% mark that would give us a good chance in referendums, and we may not get there because there's always going to be a segment of the population who prefers uh, a winner-take-all approach to politics. And they are in the minority, but in, the, in a referendum situation, it can easily swing against us. So you can see this is a poll that we did, Fair Vote Canada commissioned in Quebec. Quebec may be heading into a referendum, and this was in August, and we just asked about support for the principle of proportional representation. No system, no details. And here you can see we're at 58%. So I'm going to look now at the research. Okay, so what is it that's driving that no side? What are the factors that um, come into play in many, many, many referendums, electoral reform referendums and other referendums? So the first is the obvious. It's the obvious thing that everybody thinks of, which is just that it's a change. You're changing something. So uh, that, that status quo advantage, that this is the way we've always done it. I'm familiar with it. I understand how it works. Of course that comes into play. So Arthur Lupi is saying the no side has a huge advantage, regardless of the legislation, regardless of the system, regardless of the question. It's true throughout the world. You're running against change. People don't know what life is going to be like 
A typical no campaign is when you think about the worst case scenario and you make your whole campaign about that. So now I'm going to look at some of the things that um, Lawrence Leduc and others have identified very specifically that drives down the yes vote in a referendum and helps the no side. And I haven't included all of them because we have 40 minutes and it would get to be a lot if I included all of them. But I feel like I got the core items here and a lot of them overlap and you'll see how that is. So the referendum becomes about something that's not on the ballot. Um, you know, if people in electoral reform referendums were actually voting on what was right there in front of them, I think we would do a lot better. But instead, they're, they're often voting on what political scientists call second order issues. So something other than the actual system is driving the vote. Party divisions, and we're going to talk more about that. Low information. This is not news to anybody who's lived through one of these campaigns that most voters have very little information. Misinformation campaigns um, have a huge role to play in driving a fear-based vote. And media bias, and there's been quite a few studies we're going to look at on that. So one thing that a lot of people don't realize um, is that in Canada and the United Kingdom in the last 20 years, there have been eight electoral reform referendums. So if you're tuning into this and you just remember the referendum that happened in your province, and then you think, well, that's because it was fill in the blank with why the thing failed. Um, you know, it's bigger than that. It's about referendums for the change side in general. And so here I put, I've put down the six out of the eight that failed. And we have had every kind of system and every kind of ballot now. So we've had a simple uh, uh, one question, one system. We've had uh, the two part question, like in New Zealand, we've had the ranked ballot, we've had MMP, we've had STV, we've had a choice, we've had it all. And it's not the technicalities and it's the not the that it's the right system that's driving that's mainly driving the vote. I don't think it's these other things. So I looked at how many of these other things were came into play in each of these referendums. And you can see that every referendum is different. Every referendum is unique. Some referendums, there was hardly any misinformation campaign, but people just didn't have any information. They were confused. Other times there was huge, a huge partisan uh, effort uh, to get out the no vote. So everyone's different, but you can see here there was a, a lot of overlap and we're going to look at some examples. So the one, first one I want to talk about is what uh, I called second order issues. And that is when something other than, uh, other than the issue that you're voting on starts really driving voters to vote one way or another. So here you can see in the United Kingdom, they had a referendum on the alternative vote which is a winner take all system. Um, it's not proportional representation, but in terms of uh, how that campaign was run, why people voted yes or no, there really wasn't much difference. Um, the same thing, the same problems bedeviled that campaign that have come into play in referendums on PR. And so the no campaigners in the United Kingdom focused on a small party leader who, because they're a small party, uh, Nick Clegg wasn't very well liked. He was the one that harangled this uh, this referendum deal out of the coalition. And uh, so they made it all about him. Look at Nick Clegg, there's all kinds of things everybody hates. And if you vote for an uh, alternative vote, then Nick Clegg's going to hold the balance of power and do lots more things that you don't like. And that was enough to drive a lot of people uh, to vote no. Okay. And again, issues not on the ballot. So the no campaign was very successful and this was a this was hugely uh, effective. They made up a number about how much voting machines would cost and then they made the whole campaign about how you were going to have to pay for all this money for voting machines and they had pictures here you can see of babies, uh, soldiers, you know, everybody else who needed the money that was supposedly going to go to these these voting machines. And we saw this most recently in BC. So before the referendum campaign officially even started, uh, a millionaire bought the French front page of newspapers across BC uh, asking people, is David Eby, the BC NDP attorney general, trying to manipulate you? 
So the referendum uh, started off being not about, do you like proportional representation? Would you like your vote to count? What will be the effects of proportional representation? It became about, do you trust David Eby and the BCNDP who cook something up in the back room uh, on this referendum? And if you don't trust them and you don't like that, then vote no. And so that whole process became more important uh, in, to some people than what they were actually voting on. Just trying to move my little people here. So partisanship as a primary driver. So we don't see this in all referendums, but we do see it in some. And when the parties get involved, it can be for the good or the bad. It can be for the good if they are all on the same page and they are helping, but it can be for the not so good um, when one party is on one side and one party is on the other side. And you can see here some research from California looking at referendums over many years and showing that on governance related questions, partisan voters uh, respond to their party's interest and that partisan affiliation is basically the strongest driver of what drives the vote. And I'll show you how that worked out here. So you can see in BC um, that 82% of BC Liberal voters, and for those of you not in BC, the BC Liberals in BC are like the big tent conservatives. There's a very small conservative party that doesn't win any seats, but the party on the right is the BC Liberal Party. And you can see that 82% of those folks voted no. And that is because the BC Liberals were highly effective in getting people out, telling them all kinds of things that we're gonna talk about. And partisanship drove that vote. I mean, you saw advertisements with um, Andrew Weaver, who was then the leader of the BC Greens, shaking hands behind a closed door with John Horgan. And basically those voters were told, if you vote for proportional representation, then these two guys are gonna be in power forever and that kind of thing. And UK referendum, you saw the same thing. The conservative vote uh, was 83% no. And again, their partisan leaders stepped up and got their people out to vote. Misinformation campaigns. So these, you can see how this overlaps with partisanship, but it's sort of its own unique thing. So I'm using some examples from BC because that's our most recent one. Uh, don't, so the, the no campaign in BC put forward a lot of things that were um, fear mongering, wildly misleading and oftentimes actually factually incorrect. So for example, uh, one day during the referendum, somebody emailed me and said, yeah, I was at the gym doing my workout and there's this commercial on TV with marching soldiers uh, against proportional representation. And this is what people were seeing on TV. It was a, kind of a scary video. If you, if you risk voting for this, this is what you're gonna get. And these kind of misinformation messages uh, are effective across the political spectrum. People don't want to risk whatever it is. Factually incorrect, these messages, this full page ad ran in newspapers across the interior saying that uh, if PR passed, you would lose your local MLA and all the power would go to Vancouver. All you had to do was look on page four of the Attorney General's report uh, to see a guarantee that not no region would lose any MLAs. The number of MLAs per region was not going to change at all, but it, it didn't matter because these full page ads uh, were seen by, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And, you know, in sort of the low scraping the bottom of the barrel here, you can see a no campaign ad that was targeted toward the Chinese community saying, you know, if you vote for PR, you know, you might be forced to flee your home. So the effect of false information, misinformation um, is really big. And uh, in 2020, MIT did the biggest study ever of how false information spreads. And they looked at 126,000 stories distributed on Twitter by 3 million people over about 10 years. They found that when information was false, fear-mongering, incorrect, negative, startling, alarming, uh, that it reached way more people. It was 70% more likely to be retweeted and reached people six times faster. And they found that this effect was particularly pronounced for anything political. 
So when we on the yes side are sharing our wonderful pie charts of how things are fair and talking about how you're going to, you know, you could have a better environment and a better health system and better regional representation and a stronger voice. And then somebody seeing something with marching soldiers and my MLA is going to disappear and all kinds of extremists are going to take over the legislature. Which one do you think gets shared? I mean, so in that way, it's not a level playing field. So one of the researchers of that study just commented the false information is uh, novel and frequently negative. Those are two features that grab our attention as human beings and cause us to want to share that. Uh, so it's, it's human nature. So another factor uh, that has been identified as killing referendums in general is when the parties on the yes or side are actually divided. And I'm sure this is familiar to many of you who have lived through some of our referendums on electoral reform, where you have one party on one side who's, uh, they're not divided. They're, you know, their message is strong and clear and you get out there and vote no, because this is not in our interest, right? And then you have another party that's like supposedly for it, but then some of their MLAs are campaigning against it or the former premier has joined the yes, the no side. Um, and people are just confused. You know, they're getting, they're getting a mixed message. And during the 2016 Federal Electoral Reform Committee, uh, Leonard Russell, who was the citizen chair of the PEI's Citizens Commission on PEI's Legislative Future, uh, testified to the committee. And he said, this is the first time he had ever said this publicly. He said, what surfaced partway through our education program was I think both of the big parties realized the ramifications of proportional representation we began to get undermined by the very people that put us into place. So that can be undermined in a more low-key way, like informally, or it can be really front and center with people from the party that supposedly supports it out in front saying, please vote no. And here we can see from our, uh, oh, I'm gonna talk about media bias, of this overlaps, you can see how it overlaps. So another thing that's not helped us at all in electoral reform referendums in general is the bias of Canada's mainstream media. And it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just, it's been studied quite a lot now. So you can see this is from the MMP referendum in Ontario in 2007. For those of you who are newer, we had a referendum on mixed member proportional. It was one system, one question. And the mainstream media was unanimously opposed to it. They made sure people got almost no information and they ran all kinds of scary uh, op-eds. And here was their cartoon, what's not to love? And this is on the single system. What's not to love? Look how complicated this is, right? And so people were told over and over, this is risky. Um, this will give pe uh, people who have the balance of power who shouldn't. And as a voter, you don't know enough to vote yes. You don't know anything. So if you don't know, you must vote no. I mean, I, we saw that, I think, in PEI as well. In the UK, we saw the same thing. So a study of the UK media in their electoral reform referendum said that uh, coverage was predominantly hostile. There were just twice, over twice as many articles in favor of the status quo as in favor of reform. And the papers with the bigger circulations were more likely to oppose reform. So they might offer space for a guest op-ed from the yes side, but overall people were being inundated uh, with messages, the kind of messages that uh, would lead them to vote no. And in the BC referendum, we decided to do our own study. Um, so we did, we followed the procedure that's been followed by other researchers. We looked at opinion columns in BC media over a period of three months, and this was early on. So I think it was May, June, July, and the referendum wasn't until November um, that we did this. And here you can see um, in BC, the media, there's a monopoly on the media. There's a couple of companies that own every single paper. So whether you go this little town or that little town, you're seeing the same columns and the same articles. And we found it was overwhelmingly negative to the change side. And a lot of it was picking up on the criticisms of the process. Can't trust the politicians, can't trust the process, um, that kind of thing. Uh, 
So another problem that is probably more familiar to most people that we face in every referendum is that most people have no idea what they're voting on, unfortunately. So the education campaign really amounts to the Electoral Commission putting out a brochure and a website, which is very good that they have a brochure and a website. But the problem with the brochure and the website is that it's sort of like, it's a little bit like getting the manual for how the back of your refrigerator works. It doesn't explain why would you want to vote for this thing? What is this really about? <laughs> anyway, what's it about? You know, it, that's not explained. What you get is this big long thing with mechanics. And here you can see from the alternative vote referendum in the United Kingdom, um, because they have to be meticulously neutral and all they can say is just the technical information that uh, it took a, a one paragraph to describe first past the post, and then they took three diagrams and four pages to describe alternative vote, which is a very simple system. It's the simplest system that you can get after first past the post, um, but it appear it makes it appear complicated. So the, the neutral education campaign that people get from the government isn't always helpful. It, it's it's better than nothing, I suppose, but it's not always going to help people make a decision. They're not basing the decision on that pamphlet, I don't think. And here you can see from the last PEI referendum in 2019, um, that's one of the yes campaigners in a media story on CBC, looking at the brochure that people got explaining the mixed member proportional system. And the referendum commissioner said, sometimes it takes more words than people care to deal with. So again, you know, people are busy. Who has time to read through four or five pages of, of this thing? And again, from Lawrence Leduc, looking back at Ontario's 2007 referendum, the most persuasive argument of the no side was the lack of sufficient information. The public's frustration at a lack of information would continue to be devil proponents of MMP right through voting day. In the end, for many, it was a sufficient reason to vote against the proposal. So again, all you need to do is effectively hone in on one of these strategies and people will vote no. Whether it's you don't know enough, you're confused, it's too complicated, whether it's, it's misinformation, whether it's um, driving partisan voters to tell them to vote in their partisan self-interest, all these things kind of come into play and you don't need all of them in every referendum to, to sink the boat. So looking at the referendum that's possibly coming up in Quebec, um, again, Fair Vote Canada and Leger commission a poll to find out where are we starting from in terms of voter knowledge of what's going to be on the referendum ballot. And here we find that 70% of Quebecers uh, know absolutely all, little or absolutely nothing about what's going to be on the referendum. So again, uh, when you have, it's good that you have support for the principle, but educating millions of people on mechanics of a system while overcoming all these other huge factors is is really a challenge and it would need a government that was that was up serious about giving it a fair chance and up for the challenge and you know just to make a special note about quebec quebec polls in quebec over 20 years on the federal level have at least shown that people are more in favor of PR in Quebec than in other provinces, and they have been studying it a long time. So it's pot, every referendum is unique. We do win some, <laughs> two out of eight, we've got more than 50% of the vote. So it's impossible to say that every single referendum is gonna fail. But part of this webinar is to say, we have to be realistic about what we're facing because the opponents have got this down to a playbook. So what would be, some fairer conditions then. If you look at us starting back because we're dealing with all these things and you remember that 20 point drop from the first graph, what would be, what would make things more level? What would make things more fair? So the two referendums that have succeeded and when I mean succeeded, no, we don't have PR yet in Canada. Um, the two out of eight that succeeded, one was British Columbia in, in 2005, and that was the single transferable vote. And I love the single transferable vote, and I'm in no illusion that most people in British Columbia understood how the single transferable vote worked any more than they understood how mixed member proportional worked. So I don't think that it was the system as much as I love the system. Um, there was a few things that happened. There was a focus on a citizens assembly. So 
Uh, it was the first citizens assembly. It was the one that led led the world really um, on that scale of a citizens assembly. And the media was fairly balanced and they were mostly talking about, hey, this is neat. There's a citizens assembly. This is what they recommended. Um, there was no opponent campaign. So that's not to say there was no opponents but there wasn't an organized funded campaign delivering people scary stuff uh, for four months. There was a wrong winner election and an opposition wipeout election. So there were political circumstances that were beyond that are beyond the control of electoral reformers to create. Um, there was an election where one party won more of the popular vote, but they lost the election. And then there was a election right after that where one party uh, was left with two seats. They got completely wiped out when they had a huge percentage of the vote. So all those things kind of conspired together in the very first attempt in Canada. And I would also say that I think the opponents didn't realize that 58% were going to vote yes. And I think after that happened, um, that's when they got together and really upped their game. That's my guess. In 2016, we won the PEI campaign, not Fair Vote Canada, wonderful group in PEI, won the PEI plebiscite for proportional representation. Again, there was no opponent campaign. They, the government didn't hand out a bunch of money to yes and no, like didn't give a half a million bucks to the no side and say, go nuts, say whatever you want. Um, and the size of PEI was such that you can reach so many people like phone, kitchen table to kitchen table that's how big PEI is, right? So, and the media in PEI is the only provincial media I've ever seen that's actually fairly supportive to PR. So those three things all came together to lead to, um, you know, and, and a good campaign by the yes side to lead to a win for MMP. Um, so again, you can sort of see how the different factors play in. So to help us understand what, what might help win referendums, uh, uh, Australian Human Rights Commission did a study on this. So Australia has had 44 referendums on constitutional issues. And of those 44, 18% succeeded. <laughs> so they looked at what was it about the, I think it's eight of them, the 18% of them that succeeded uh, the, compared to the 82% that failed, what was different? Here's what it was. One, strong support for the proposal by all major political parties. So you can't have parties that are sitting around saying, oh, we're neutral, we're not gonna get involved or party, one party's for it another party's against it. And uh, you know, it, there's strong support for the proposal. So that's sort of saying, you know, we um, as parties have decided this is a good thing and we would like you, the population to affirm it. A sense of ownership of the referendum issue by citizens. So not something that appears to be cooked up in the back room as we, uh, as we were accused of in BC. And an educational campaign that ensures citizens understand the issue. And I, was, I assume that would go with the political leadership part. If the government's serious, um, then they will make some effort to make sure that people understand what the vote is about. Oh, parts of this slide didn't load, show anyway. Okay, um, well, that worked. So to, I'm going to sum up just with, uh, to give you a little sneak peek into our next webinar on citizens assemblies. And this is just a little bit of a contrast. So people might wonder why are we so much in favor of citizens assemblies and so cautious about referendums considering uh, the barriers that we face. So if you can co contrast this, you can see in a referendum, there's many, many uninformed voters and misinformed voters. And that's been proven in exit poll. I mean, after the referendums, there was an exit poll in BC and they broke down how many people voted no because they thought this, how many because they thought that, how much because they thought that. All those things, that those no side messages uh, resonated. And they only, each one only needs to resonate with one group and, and you've got to, and you've got to win. Um, so in a citizens assembly, you are getting a group of people who are making a fully informed decision. By the end of the citizens assembly, they know everything there is to know about what it, what it is. They're doing it on behalf of citizens. Um, Self-selected participants in a referendum. So you can see this in both sides, right? In BC, I think about 40%, 42%, I don't know, 
turned out for the BC referendum on electoral reform. So those are the people that are most motivated, right? The ones on the yes and the ones on the no. And the no, of course, were won the contest of getting people out. Um, in a citizens assembly, people are selected by a civic lottery. So the idea is to create a mini public, to create a group of people by age, by education, by income, by gender, that truly reflect the population, not just the people who are most motivated to vote on a particular issue. In a referendum, partisan motivations can be a big factor. In a citizens assembly, the studies have shown it's just not. In a referendum, it's basically months of people with different opinions yelling past each other. Um, in a citizens assembly, it's months of people sitting together and li really listening to each other. And in a referendum, the process ends with a winner and a loser. And in a citizens assembly, the process ends with a consensus that the group has found that's based on the common good. So that's just a little preview to our next, uh, our next refer uh, webinar on citizens assemblies. And now I'm going to ask Lawrence Leduc to come back on and help us with all the questions. So I wanna say that I'm not an expert. These, this is research that I've pulled together from people that are experts. And I'm really, really glad to have Larry joining us tonight to take your questions. And now I'm going to get out of my screen and look at the question box. So everybody just bear with me here. Well, I do have a few picked out for you, Anita, if you'd like to. Um, yeah, do you want to do that? So the one that I think is kind of a fundamental question, which was asked a couple of times, is does electoral reform require a, a referendum in Canada? Is it a constitutional change? What are the requirements for actually getting electoral reform in Canada? And I'm not sure if you or Professor Leduc want to answer that. Yeah, well, I, I think the answer to that is a pretty straightforward no. I mean, there is no legal requirement anywhere in Constitution or in any, any other law in Canada for a, a referendum be, being required to change the electoral system. And I think one of the mistakes that's been made in the uh, electoral reform efforts uh, thus far in this country has been to kind of assume that it was to start kind of start from a position that, well, we can develop a proposal, but then we have to put it to the people in some form to get it approved. Now, that was never necessary in BC or Ontario or, or federally, but once you, the, the dilemma is this, once you've done that, you can't undo it. And, uh, and so therefore, once you've had a referendum, it's much more difficult to defend the position that you don't really need one because if I were to make a, a, a proposal today uh, and say, well, we could and just let parliament enact that, uh, they would say, well, you've got to have a referendum, you know, because that's what we did the last time. And because the people voted against it once, if you want to reverse that result, you, you would have to have another referendum. And I think we've, now we're kind of in that box and I'm not sure there's an easy way out of it. The same thing, very much the same thing happened in Quebec with the sovereignty referendums. They made the decision early on, after the PQ came to power in 1976, uh, that they would uh, hold a referendum on sovereignty. And then th that basically meant that the sovereignty debate from 1980 onward always meant that you had to go back to the referendum model because no one would have accepted a decision by the National Assembly in favor of sovereignty or something something like it. They would say, well, people, the people voted against it before, and now if you want to undo that result, you're going to have to go to a referendum. So I completely agree with the argument that it's not necessary, but I don't know how to escape from that politics that I think we're pretty much locked into now. If I could comment on that, I think on a, on a uh, provincial level, it's really hard. So if you look at BC, right, they've had a precedent now of having three referendums. It would be hard right now to go and say, okay, we're just going to do this and have no referendum. It's of course it's possible. Anything's possible when there's political will, when the politicians yeah. want to do something, you better bet they do it and they don't have a referendum on it either. So it's not that it's not possible on a federal level. Um, you know, as disappointing and heartbreaking and infuriating as the 
federal process was. The one thing Justin Trudeau said that I actually agreed with, he said uh, he was in a group, I think it was a, yeah, it was a group he was talking about the upcoming supposed change that was going to happen and somebody was doing the referendum thing. And he said, you know, basically with all due respect, sir, the people that tend to call for a referendum know that a referendum is a pretty good way to make sure you don't get any, any reform. Yeah. So, and he said that. And so he, the liberals were actually very consistent. They don't want a referendum. They also felt it would be divisive for the country. And that's another thing that they said that it, I agreed with. Wow, that's two, eh? Um, on the electoral reform issue. And Ed Broadbent made that point as well. He said, what would happen if uh, one province voted yes and one province voted no? Do we really want to put people through a divisive process like that? Um, and I think that's why we're looking and around the world, people are looking to citizens assemblies now, they're really picking up steam. There's uh, one in the UK on climate, one in France on climate, uh, one in Scotland on the future of Scotland. Um, so citizens assemblies are being looked at as a way to bring people into the conversation in a meaningful way. And in terms of legitimacy, 67% of the people who testified at the ERE as experts said, please don't have a referendum. Just if you're going to do that, don't waste your time. You know, if you have, you know, uh, if you ran on this, if there's multiple parties in support of it, doesn't mean every party, um, then you have the legitimacy, you know, to move forward. It's, it's a, there has to be a combination of things that develop that legitimacy, but it doesn't need to go to the popular vote. But I totally agree with Larry that once there's been a precedent set at some level, it's very easy for the opponents to latch onto that. And that's exactly what the conservatives did. Um, they don't need to oppose any proposal. They just have to say, let's have a referendum. Right, so on a related note here, a question about the countries around the world that are currently using proportional representation. Have they always used it or have they had referendums to get there? Do you want to take it or do you want me to? Um, yeah, well, of course, if you look around the world at all electoral systems, uh, most countries have the electoral system that they started with uh, at, at some point in their history. Uh, sometimes there have been minor changes, but there aren't that many cases of a complete reform. But let me mention the two that have been successful, which I think is the, the most written about in the field. Uh, the first, of course, is New Zealand, which we all look to as a a model, um, and New Zealand did manage to reform their electoral system, and they had uh, two referendums on it to get there, plus a third referendum to affirm it 10 years later in which the people voted to keep the new system. But it took them 20 years, it took three governments, it took a uh, Royal Commission, uh, two, now three referendums, and a, and a Supreme Court decision before it was over. So it was certainly not easy, and the idea to start with the referendum was by a government that was opposed to electoral re reform that wanted to shut down the debate. And because they called that referendum and then lost control of it, that that's how the process started. Uh, the other case, which is rarely talked about and which has always been of interest to me, uh, is Japan. And mm -hmm. Japan took even longer to get to electoral reform, uh, over 30 years, depending on where you start the debate from, uh, they never had a referendum, but they had a number of proposals put forward by different governments, uh, none of which was able to gain a majority of support in parliament, in the parliament and yet, um, until finally the governing party, the longtime governing party in, in Japan, the LDP, uh, finally lost an election. And they were replaced in that election by a seven party coalition and the only thing the seven parties in the coalition could really agree on was the need to have a change in the electoral system. So they did it. They basically negotiated it within parliament, all seven parties getting a little bit of what they wanted in a change to the system. And it was en en enacted in, uh, in Japan in, uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so the, um, you know, there are examples both ways. But it can be done certainly without a referendum. But Japan has no tradition of referendums or no constitutional requirements. So there was never any idea that there had to be one on this issue. And the decision of the parliamentary coalition that brought it in was accepted. And it's still there. Right. 
So I think, um, you know, there's a couple of ways, right? So either, like Lawrence said, you start with that electoral system and that's the system you still have, you know, just like in Canada, right? Uh, or, or there's an act of legislation that passes it. So electoral reform is very much an issue of partisan self-interest historically. Yeah. Yeah. When one of the big parties decides that it's more in their self-interest uh, to change the system, then you get a change. That doesn't mean there's not a role for the small parties, you know, traditionally for the workers' movements and that kind of thing. But unfortunately, it can be a bit of a cold calculation. You know, and I the one example I always try to look look at is Switzerland, right? So Switzerland uh, had a referendum in 1918 to get PR. They're one of I think they're the only other than New Zealand OECD country that did it by a referendum. And I look in Switzerland, women didn't get the right to vote till 1971. That's three years before I was born. Do you know why? I bet you can find out why now by watching this referendum, this referendum webinar, because they had to do it by a referendum. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So they, they were 60 years behind everybody else or whatever it is. Do we want to be, we're already more than 60 years behind most of the developed world in terms of our electoral system. And as long as we keep banging our head on this referendum wall, we, it might be a while, right? So yeah. we're trying to build political will and other means of citizen engagement to build legitimacy. And Switzerland has a strong referendum tradition that's embedded in the constitution. So it, 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 it's a different starting point. It's a, it's a very different starting point. And right. I mean, I talked to a fellow from Germany who's uh, you know big into the in citizens assemblies and also in direct democracy. And I was explaining to him the problem we have here with referendums, you know, because he's a big fan of them. And he said, well, yeah, but in your situation, you can't just dump a referendum on people on a country that has no experience with them. Like you can't, that's no wonder you get this, these kind of outcomes, right? So it, yeah. it does very much depend on the context. Hazel, you have another one. I do. I'm trying to get through these questions. There's Sorry. some good ones, um, but I, I want to make sure that we try and get to as many of the ones that refer specifically to referendums as possible. There's obviously a lot on proportional representation, but that's not the focus of today's webinar. So I'm going to focus on the ones that ask about referendums specifically. So here's a question. Um, several of our participants have talked about the idea of using the no size tactics against them. Is there any research on using a fear-based approach for a yes side? <laughs> Lawrence? Uh, I, I'm sure there is somewhere, but I can't think of a good example at the moment because so many referendums are, have been structured in this way where there's a proposal put forward by a government or a commission or some elite organization. And often that uh, proposal is put together behind closed doors or in a way where it doesn't get a lot of a public of public attention until the final report is released. Uh, we had that with our constitutional referendum, of course, in 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 in, in Canada, the Charlottetown Accord was, you know, negotiated by the premiers in closed meetings, and then all of a sudden it was sprung on the public. And uh, and then there was a rush to a referendum because they thought it would be fairly easy to, to get it through, which of course it, it wasn't. So that's, that's the model that we're most familiar with is the proposal comes from somewhere, not usually from a citizens assembly as Anita was suggesting, although we have some examples of that uh, provincially in Canada, uh, but usually from some small body that where it has not been subject to a lot of public debate. And then the referendum happens quickly and there's a real uh, misinformation problem or lack of information problem. Uh, and it's very hard to then get it through. I'm trying to think of a reverse example and it's hard to come up. Okay. I can't think of it. I, I can't think of an example, but is the sound funny? Can anybody hear an echo or something? Okay, it's just me. Um, okay, so I remember reading a piece of research by Alan Renwick. Uh, one yeah. of the researchers that I studied. And basically he said that, yes, it's possible for the yes side to, to win a change referendum based on fear, but people have to be more afraid of keeping what's there than of the change. Mm 
So when you look in our context, right, people would have to be so afraid of the consequences of keeping first past the post compared to the consequences of changing. And that's just not the situation that we have in Canada. Um, most people are not terrified of keeping first past the post, but that worked for them, uh, you know, in the Brexit campaign. That was one of the few campaigns where the change side actually won. And part of the fear-based misinformation was, you know, that big bus that we're sending gazillion dollars to the European Union. Of course, it was all made up, right? Yeah. But people were afraid of that. So occasionally it can work, but can it work for something that's sort of, I hate to say, dry and geeky like electoral reform? Probably not. Yeah, I, I kind of thought of one, or it's at least it's 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 a, an example that came to mind. You know the um, referendums on the European constitutional treaties, and the one and the ones in France and in the Netherlands uh, followed the, the the same kind of script, where once the proposal was released, it looked like it should pass easily, and then the misinformation campaigns set in, and they were they and they were defeated. But the one in Spain. That took place at almost the same time uh, went exactly the opposite way, because uh, the the uh, the the yes side uh, basically out organized the no, uh, started well ahead of them, and they ran a sort of a, a patriotic flag waving campaign about Spain Spain and Europe, you know, and it probably had as much disinformation in it as any of the no campaigns did, but they caught the uh, the, the the no side relatively un, unprepared. And it never really got off the ground. And then, of course, a short time later, in in France and the Netherlands, you had a uh, an opposition organized and was able to defeat those proposals. But the Spanish referendum, it didn't get much attention because it was not as not as contentious. Interesting. I I, I want to just add to that. Sorry, Gisela. Exactly the same thing happened in PEI. So you guys will remember that I mentioned that. Part of the help in 2005 in BC was that the no campaigns didn't have any experience. They didn't realize that people would actually might actually vote for this, right? And then they got, oh wow, oh, you know, maybe we better start doing something, right? That happened in PEI in 2016 in the plebiscite. For those who are thinking, oh, the questions can be too complicated, PEI's plebiscite was a ranked ballot with five systems, two of whom were newly invented and nobody had ever heard of. So, and it won. Okay, yeah. that complicated question won. Why did it win? There was no opponent campaign. I think the government, I'm just speaking for myself here, I think the government honestly thought the ones that cooked this up, that the question was going to be so complicated that the thing would go down in flames and they didn't have to fund a no side. And so when it got 52% and they still refused to enact it because they said the turnout wasn't high enough, then they just copied what everybody else did. They said, okay, we're going to have a referendum this time, and we're now we're going to fund a yes and a no side. So yeah. it's exactly what Larry's saying, is that they learn as they go what works. Yeah. Okay, Gisela. Here's another challenging technical question for you. Um, we, so given what we now know about referenda, are there statistics for referenda of a specific sort, ones that are held to affirm a choice that has already been made? And, for, and the person gave the example of, um, for example, a voting system that has already been used for two or three cycles. So we're confirming that choice, but initially there was no referendum. It's done after experience with the new system. Yeah, I mean, I there are two different th things there. I think you're thinking of maybe trying to bring in somehow a new voting system and then have a referendum on it later after it's been adopted. Um, that sounds like an attractive idea, but I think it's it would be very hard to to sell it politically. In other words, if you're bringing if you're bringing in a something like a voting system as a kind of an experiment, which you would then later at some Future date, ask people to to approve of um, the yeah. The, the, back to the question though about about whether you're affirming or something or voting against it. Um, I think one of the things we've learned about referendums is that framing them in yes no terms gives a real advantage to the no side. Um, I've written a few papers on this subject, and uh, it doesn't almost it almost doesn't matter what the question is 
if it's a question that is easy to misrepresent or is widely misunderstood, then that maximizes the no vote. Uh, in the Brexit referendum in the UK, uh, they were very wary of that, and they deliberately f worded the question as vote remain or leave, not vote yes or no. They didn't put forward a proposal that Britain should uh, uh, leave the European Union or Britain should uh, stay in the European Union, vote yes or no. They said basically should uh, uh, Britain remain in, uh, uh, I'm, I forget the exact wording now, but the, the vote was remain or leave, not yes or no. And that was thought of at the time that the question was framed as a more neutral framing. And it would be interesting to think about what might have happened if the question should, had been, should Britain withdraw from the European Union, yes or no? Uh, I think the no side in that case would have had, probably would have had an advantage, but it's a counterfactual, of course, that you can't really you know, amass evidence for. I think um, just if I, if I could start that confirmation referendum idea, I think I hear that from a lot of people, and I think that's because there's one party that's that's suggesting it. And I understand the superficial sort of appeal of it. When you look at New Zealand, first of all, they had a very they had a very unique set of political circumstances. And I remember talking to a campaigner in New Zealand who told me he didn't think if it would happen today they would win today. They had a bunch of political circumstances. The people were angry. It got channeled into that vote for for MMP that are it's hard, really hard to recreate. In terms of their supposed confirmation referendum, that was demanded by uh, the large opposition party that wanted to kill it. And it didn't happen after two election cycles. It happened after five. Yeah. So by the time New Zealand had their, re their confirmation referendum demanded by the big conservative party, um, they had had MMP for 15 years. Think of all the politicians who were, could only deal with first past the post politics that would have either adapted to working together because they had no choice or they would have died or retired by then. By the time the, by the, time the referendum came in, came in, the second one, there were people who were in their 30s who had never voted under first past the post. Uh, PR had, for a large part of the population, become the status quo. And I think that a combination of those things all really helped. So I would be really just cautious about people who think that we can have two elections and then have a, a referendum and necessarily win it. I, it would, would it help us? Probably, um, the fact that it's been used. But if you look at the motivations of the big parties, if the two big parties that are reluctant know that they can have a referendum coming up in the near future and they can get the first past the post system back, they are not going to be motivated to make those minority or coalition governments work and they are not going to be motivated to make the system work they will do the opposite and make sure that they frame every problem from a rainy day to you know whatever that it's the fault of the new voting system because they know that referendum's coming so you really need to leave a bunch of space for people to see a change in the political culture and a change in the political culture it takes time the voters can adapt, but let's say some of the long-term partisans to have a little of a longer learning curve. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, who's Gisela? Sorry. Okay, here's another one. Um, previous citizens' assemblies uh, were followed by referendums. Are we now suggesting the citizens' assembly would make the voting decision, or how would that work in terms of legislation? That was the question I had for Anita when I heard her talking earlier about citizens' assemblies. Uh, I'm a big fan of citizens' assemblies also, partly based on the, the Ontario experience with it. But would you just have a citizens' assembly to bring in reform and nothing else? Would they have the final say? Well, I think when people often say, well, we want to get around the politicians, we want to quote unquote binding citizens assembly. There's not there's nothing, there's no such thing as a binding citizens assembly. I'm sorry to deflate anybody's balloon. We we can't get electoral reform in this country without a majority of MPs voting for it in the House of Commons. So usually it would start at a parliamentary committee, 
who would uh, help commission would decide the question. It would get turned over to an independent body. This is very important. It's not the parties running the citizens assembly. It's a neutral third party with an expertise in running deliberative processes that would run the citizens assembly. They would make a recommendation to parliament and then parliament could vote yes or no on their recommendation. The politicians could sit down and look at the recommendation and negotiate and say, hey, you, know, you don't know what's gonna happen. Hey, you know, maybe we're not willing to go that far, but we would like this. Anything could happen after the citizens assembly, but they can't force the government to do anything. What it does is like, um, it builds legitimacy into the process. It makes citizens of Canada feel like this is their thing. These are their people. These are people just like them on this assembly um, who have come up with this proposal that's in everybody's interest, not just in the interest of one party. So it really strengthens the electoral reform movement. Whether you get reform out of that right away or not, it makes the whole movement a lot stronger and builds uh, credibility in the minds of of Canadians and experts and that the recommendations of that assembly are going to stand the test of time unless they are defeated in a referendum they will stand the test of time until they're acted on so it also gives um, the parties that are in favor of reform or in politicians that are in favor something to run on that has cross-party legitimacy yeah. that's the best yeah. I can answer it it's not a it's no magic there's no magic way yeah yeah, in the end, we have to recognize that in Canada, at least, the final decision is going to be made by Parliament one way or another. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so if the point is that referenda are fundamentally unsuitable for this type of a complex question, how do we get rid of the notion that referenda are necessary? And how would we make it politically saleable to pass electoral reform without referenda in Canada? Thoughts on that? So with some questions around that. Well, I mean, I guess, I, I guess, so we look at there's a precedent right now in certain provinces for referendums. Yes, that's a barrier. On the other hand, I'm just going to share a personal experience with you guys. After the BC referendum, you know, when I spent so long crying and devastated and convinced this was it, man, the nail was it, last nail was in the coffin and all that stuff. I talked to people in other parts of the country who didn't even know this referendum happened. So we in the bubble <laughs> are very aware that the precedent is referendums, but a lot of people it's not their precedent because they've never really even tuned into this issue. By far the largest part of Canadians have never tuned into this issue. And every time it comes up, it's all new for them. As frustrating as that is, there's the hopeful side of it is that we can set a new precedent. And that's what we're seeing around the world with citizens assemblies is that they're starting to set a new precedent for, for legitimate citizen decision-making. So that, I mean, that's what I would say is encouraging the use of citizens assemblies in general and pointing to other examples around the world. Lawrence. Yeah, and, and I think uh, also at the federal level, there is no precedent either. We're talking about the provinces here. And there's only been the one attempt at electoral reform at the federal level. And that was the, the Trudeau commitment supposedly to a change of some kind in the electoral system. And then that resulted in the special committee. And the special committee was not taken too seriously when it was first set up because it looked like its role was simply to, you know, to, to sideline the debate or move it off the, the front pages. But as it got going, uh, people began to take the special committee much more seriously and it began to take itself more seriously. And, uh, and then at the end, the special committee had some very, very good ideas about how to proceed with developing an electoral reform proposal before the Liberals shut it down. But if you read the, the recommendations of the special, special committee, they, were, they would have been quite happy at that point to turn the matter over to a, um, to a government commission or somebody like that, which would, that would have been given some specific directives about the type of system that had to be developed. The idea, for example, that you had to have a threshold for proportionality was in the special committee report. And that's why the Liberals shut it down because they didn't 
they didn't want to go down that road, you know, but there's an, an interesting precedent there. And I could have seen if the liberals had been more open to what Trudeau had initially suggested in terms of just re reforming first past the post without making a specific proposal, if they had let that run, we might well have gotten much further with the development of a proposed proposal without a referendum. And there would have been in that process then some intra-parliamentary negotiation between the parties, because that's really what was going on in the special committee, is the, 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 the parties which were all represented on that committee were talking to each other throughout those, those hearings. And uh, you could see their, their, the views of some of them changing or moderating in various ways as they listen to the different arguments and the testimony and so on. So that might be a, a better process for Canada in some ways. A citizens assembly could certainly be part of it. You know, you could, they're not incompatible, right. but uh, they were not, although the conservatives were beating the referendum drum throughout those proceedings, uh, I think there was an openness to going to a second step that was not a referendum, but was some kind of a, a, a committee or a commission that would then develop a proposal that would come back then to the committee or to parliament, and then they would decide on the next step. And that's what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to pick up that ball that got dropped and s smashed yeah. in 2017 and pick it up at the Liberals the Liberal MPs, for those who didn't follow it back in 2016, when the report of the Electoral Reform Committee came out, the Liberal MPs had their own separate press conference where they recommended breaking the promise. But if you read through their supplementary report, which is on the whole pretty awful, um, in there it's it said um, it said that they they recommend a more comprehensive and thorough citizen engagement. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're picking up right now. You know, they recommended it, you know, let's get going. And Lawrence is absolutely right when he says that it doesn't have to be a citizens assembly or a parliamentary process. They can run in parallel, but the citizen legitimacy part of it is really important because when you just put politicians in a room, uh, we had the liberal committee, uh, the first one in 1921, the second one in 1936. Now we've had 2016. And I guarantee if we have another one, it'll end in the same way. I mean, I'd bet I'd, I'd bet my house on it because th when they get their, when the partisan interest comes into play, we need a, at least a parallel process of citizens to keep them uh, on track and to help the public keep them on track. Yeah, and a process that's more transparent and involves more, more deliberation in which people will become engaged over time as they learn more about the, the issues. Exactly. Okay, Gisela. Lots of questions about citizens' assemblies, Anita. I hope that um, that we do have that next webinar soon because that is there's definitely a lot of curiosity about that. Um, maybe we could just touch on a couple of the ones that are sort of basic, I think, to the notion of a citizens' assembly. How are how are can you maybe just review again how the citizens are chosen to participate and who decides what experts inform them? Lawrence? Yeah, well, the, the, the example, the BC and Ontario examples are the ones we have to work with and they were basically uh, chosen from the voting rolls um, by, by uh, letters sent out to people and then they, they could uh, apply to, to be on and then, the, and then if the people who applied were randomly selected to represent, uh, to be representatives in the assembly. So it wasn't exactly random selection because there was a self-selection element in there, but it started with a random draw from the voting rolls and then letters sent out and then people were recruited to serve and uh, then their names were selected at that point. So it would be a process, something like that probably. Um, wouldn't, be a, wouldn't be probably a process where they would run for seats in the assembly or an electoral process. I think there'd be different selection processes that could be used, but what you want is something that produces a body that is reasonably representative of the population as a whole. And almost any kind of random sampling process uh, that you might use, the same as you would use in polling, basically, 
uh, would work in terms of the selection. Um, but of course, you can't force people to participate. So that's where that's where you have to have some element of self-selection. But I know my experience with the Ontario Assembly, it was about as representative looking a body, I think, as I've ever seen in politics in Canada. You know, you, you didn't have to, to watch them at work very long to realize that this was a little microcosm of Ontario. You could see, uh, you know, the same the same issues, the same groups, the same uh, demographics in, represented in there that we would think of if we were thinking of the province as a whole. So that's really what you would want. And then you want that body to be deliberative you, and you want them to take some time and uh, learn about the subject that they're debating and talk to each other. And I watched that group in Ontario go from a, a group of people that probably were on balance pretty skeptical about electoral reform to, to almost, a, almost a unanimous position on the proposal that they recommended. I think the phone, final vote, if I remember, it was 93 to six or something like, something like that. So they really started from a beginning where they had no proposal being put forward to consider. They developed their own proposal based on their own readings and uh, lectures and research and so on. And then a near consensus built around it. And the problem, the only problem with it was is that the assembly was almost completely sidelined by the government that created it. I think that in Ontario, we might have gotten a different outcome if, that, if there had been people there watching that assembly do its work right from the beginning or over the six months that it, uh, it sat, you know, and if it, if it had gotten a lot of publicity. But by the time its report came out, Despite the consensus behind it, uh, no one knew what to make of it because they'd barely heard that there was such a thing as a citizens' assembly working on this topic in Ontario. BC was better, I think, uh, at least the first uh, the, the the first time around, and it had much uh, much more publicity. The Vancouver Sun particularly gave it more coverage and more positive coverage, but that certainly didn't happen in Ontario. I think that's what, what we're talking about when we talk about referendums is the huge disconnect between the amazing work that citizens assemblies can do that's qualitatively sort of the opposite of what you get in a referendum campaign and then not being able to bridge that over to the general public. So part of a citizens assembly is that the government needs to fund an awareness that the citizens assembly is happening because if it's, because that is the, the main thing. I mean, even without a referendum, that's extremely important that people know that there's people just like them deliberating in the, on this and working on their behalf. And yeah. I don't know if anybody, if you got, have uh, you follow this, have seen this, I just saw this the other day, there's going to be a global climate assembly where they're yeah. picking a thousand random people. But the, the extra step that they're also doing is they're going, they're involving the general public, the people that weren't uh, selected by the civic lottery, allowing them to have meetings all across the world and feed into the assembly. And what that does is it makes everybody feel like this is their thing. And it's, it's everybody's involved, everybody's invited, everybody's included. And that's really important when you get a citizens assembly too, yeah. to bridge to the public, not so much about the system details, but, a, but the trust factor. Yeah. Yeah, you can't have people at the end of the assembly, you can't have the public wondering, well, who are these people, you know, and why should I pay attention to them? They have to, that has to be built up gradually and that takes time. Exactly, and there needs to be funding. One of the things that Shoney Fields, who was on the BC Citizens Assembly told us is that they found out basically there was no uh, funding for education. So yeah. they, they got together, pooled their money, bought a, bought a telephone line uh, so people could call them and, you know, and she said, next time, have the members of the assembly, I mean, they go around doing consultations all over the country, the actual members of the assembly in communities, but fund them to go out after the assembly and keep talking to people because the people that participated on it are the best ones to explain uh, what happened and what they recommended. Yeah. Yeah. So on that note, um, talking about sort of broadcasting more widely the deliberations of a citizens assembly, um, is there 
value to having citizens contribute to that process while an assembly is happening. And also, um, just a little more clarification, people are not quite sure yet about how you go about setting up a citizen assembly. Can I set one up? But what does it take? Well, you could probably set one up, but I don't think it would have any official status. Um, I think they have to be they have to be created by governments in some way to have legitimacy. There might be an arm's length way of doing that, but it was the decision of the Ontario and BC governments to create the Citizens Assembly. It was quite an inno innovative idea at that time. I think, as Anita pointed out, the Citizens Assembly have been more widely used since then for other purposes and other issues, but. Um, it, it, would, it has to start somewhere and it, ha it would probably have to start with the government doing it or a government setting up a, a process by which it would be created, perhaps at arm's length, so it didn't look like it was too being directed too politically from the center. Right. So, if, for right. example, Airbo Canada isn't going to set up a citizens assembly. First of all, we don't have millions and millions of dollars to do it. And, you know, you have to put that in the context of the federal budget. One day I figured out how much, how many millions would it take to set up the citizens assembly and do proper education and put it in a calculator. And it was something like 0. 0.000000, whatever of the uh, one year federal budget. So it ends up sounding like a lot of money, but it's really like a, a drop in the bucket for the government to do this. Money is, is really not the issue but it's the government legitimacy. When the government sets it up, then they're gonna to listen to it. If another group sets it up, even if they commission an independent body to do it, which is what needs to be done, um, then the government doesn't feel obligated to listen to it. So that's why we're really focused on pressuring the government to the parties to work together and set this up. We're getting close to the end of our time here. Uh, we're going to start the French version in about 12 minutes. So yeah. I just want to um, encourage people to attend the next one, um, which Anita will be talking about. But also um, just, Anita, maybe you just wanna talk about what people can do now. A lot of people are asking, so how can we help now? How can we, in the absence of creating our own citizens assembly, move this conversation forward? Right, so. Five minutes, and if we want to have a pause. Yeah, so Fairville Canada has been pushing this idea of a national citizens assembly and electoral reform for, oh, I don't know, uh, will it be two, a year and a half? That's a small length of time. I mean, think of how long we've worked on educating on PR in Canada and raising awareness of proportional representation. And now we're trying to get our own supporter base educated on citizens assemblies. So, I mean, one thing you can do is share this. When the video comes out, I'll send it out, uh, you know, to everybody who registered, share it or share your own summary of it uh, with people you know, share the website, nationalcitizensassembly.ca. I created that website because it doesn't look like the Fairville Canada website. It's basically, um, it's not as partisan. You know, it doesn't look like, oh, this is a left or a right thing. Unfortunately, Fairville Canada, fortunately or unfortunately, PR is a social democratic issue. So we tend to look more on the left, but a National Citizens Assembly and Electoral Reform is an idea that should be embraced and is embraced by citizens across the political spectrum. We had huge support for it in a poll in September. 80% of people, including conservative uh, voters, said this is a good idea. So the nationalcitizensassembly.ca website gives you all the basic information about how citizens are selected, how these assemblies work, where some other ones are happening around the world. The next other thing you can do is talk to whatever political parties you support and encourage them to talk about this because just like proportional representation, they uh, like to talk about sexier things that get them votes instead of process issues that are like much more important sometimes. So encourage them, the NDP and the Greens already officially support a National Citizens Assembly and electoral reform, but have you ever heard them talk about it? Um, Jagmeet Singh wrote a letter to the prime minister this fall asking uh, Trudeau to work with him on this. How many people know about that? Uh, that's where you can help. Share that letter, share the website, when you click off this webinar, we have a Christmas card thing where 
9,000 of us have now sent holiday cards to Justin Trudeau, calling for a National Citizens Assembly and electoral reform. Ho, ho, ho. I'm sure he'll be thrilled to get those bags of cards from us. But, you know, Trudeau said not enough people care about this. Too few people care about this. We have to change that um, by more of us taking these actions. Um, those are three things that I just thought of right now. I think I can't really think of anything else. It's just continued pressure. We want to make this an issue in the next election campaign. And that means that the parties are going to need to hear from you that you want to hear them talking about this. Otherwise, they're not going to talk about it. Uh, any, do you have any ideas, Larry, about how else people can help us push our campaign? Well, I'll get, I'll get to work on my Christmas card. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great idea, Anita. And I think you're right. You have to you have to somehow get the government. And I think maybe uh, as the next election begins to approach, in, in trying to embarrass them a bit on their commitment that they that they uh, broke the last time might put a little more pressure on as well. I, yeah, I just want to follow up with that. And we did that a lot in the last election because a lot of us were very disappointed and angry. And, you know, but I'm going to tell you something with this Christmas card thing, because people send it online, I have to look at the spreadsheet of thousands of cards and messages and get rid of anybody that said, you know, some really nasty and unrelated stuff. But in the process of skimming all those messages, people have not forgotten about the broken promise. Yeah. It's, it doesn't matter that he, he dumped it. It doesn't matter that he didn't run on in the last election. A huge number of people in Canada, not just fair vote supporters, media too, are never gonna forget that he promised to change the electoral system. He made sales pitches for changing the electoral system. And so it's always good to keep reminding uh, Mr. Trudeau that that promise matters, that we still want it, um, that people would like to see him leave a legacy. Uh, those and I wonder if the experience of being in a minority government might uh, might uh, have the potential to affect some change in their, their thinking about this. We would hope. Yeah. Just one final technical question here before we move to our break then. Um, will the chat be saved and shared too? I know that you plan on, the, the webinar is being recorded and we plan on sharing that on our Fairboat Canada YouTube channel. Does that include the chat? I don't know. Not usually. I've never, uh, I've never looked and downloaded the chat. If there's something you saw in the chat that you, oh yeah, that's interesting reference. Just email me and I'll probably know what it is and send it to you. I don't usually send out a whole list of people's chat. Yeah, so can, someone has just po po pointed out in the chat that you can copy and paste the bits that you would like right now. So if you- There you go. There you go. And I also want to remi remind people that if there's anybody new on this webinar, um, you know, and you want to learn more about proportional representation, because we're on a sort of a side topic about referendums, and uh, how they're not politically neutral, uh, then we will be running PR 101 again, probably sometime this spring, um, where you can ask all your basic proportional representation related questions. And we did get quite a few of those. Okay, I wanna thank everybody for taking your time. Uh, thank, especially thank Larry LaDuc for joining us. Uh, I was thrilled to see a huge number of people on this webinar. I hope the information uh, was helpful. And yeah, thanks for your support. And I'm gonna sign off.